Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. Always, you know how much I appreciate your time. I think you're going to definitely enjoy this week's guest. With me is Mary Fridley, and we are going to be talking about reimagining dementia, finding more joy. And so I am going to let Mary introduce herself because she said she's got too much to say for me to remember. So thanks for joining me, Mary. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me. This is wonderful. And I'm, I'm thrilled to, if you will, meet your your community. Uh, I'm a big fan of communities, building community. That's what I've spent the last 40 odd years of my life doing. So I love meeting communities. Um, just formally, um, I am the co-founder uh, together with a, a dear colleague of mine, uh, the late Dr. Susan Massad. Together about seven or eight years ago, we founded um, a workshop and conversation series called The Joy of Dementia. You got to be kidding. And uh, then a little later on, but certainly coming out of that work and the people we were meeting um, in 2020, we uh, were the co-founders and I continued to lead um, an international coalition called Reimagining Dementia, a creative coalition for justice that has about 825 members around the country, about 33 um, countries. Uh, and we're continuing to to move forward. That sounds wonderful. International. It's definitely more of a global community these days than it was when my mom first had Alzheimer's and oh, after my I dad agree. passed and my dad passed away in twenty seventeen and I started the podcast in twenty eighteen and that doesn't sound like that far away, like that long ago, but it kind of is. It was a different <laughs> world. I mean, I was I was speaking with a, a, a new coalition member who's in Germany, and we he's very involved with music, which I think is wonderful, and, and bringing music to people living with dementia. And we were talking, and he was asking me about the coalition, and I said, well, really, I mean, you can come up with highfalutin reasons to do anything, <laughs> depending on how grand you want to make yourself seem. But really, I think in a sense, and, and I'm speaking in this moment in particular about the coalition, it really was a product of the pandemic, to your point, because um, both because it was a, it was really sparked by just what we were seeing unfold um, and the impact and the disproportionate impact and the just awful impact that pandemic was having in nursing homes, care homes, among older adults people living with dementia, and many of whom, in my view, and I don't, I'm not asking everyone to agree with me, but in many instances, I believe they were being allowed to die um, during the pandemic. Um, but, but nevertheless, regardless of whether that's your take on it, I think we've all been aware for a long time that the conditions in care homes are just not sufficient, period, for anybody. And and though that's largely hidden away, like it, most of us who don't, I mean, my mom ended up being in a, in a care home, so I'm very familiar with them, but not everyone is, and not everybody wants to, do, to know much about them. But nevertheless, I think, so I think the, the pandemic and the headlines and just the endless coverage just pulled back the curtain in a way that you had to see it. And people, even I know people in my life were just very upset, just on a human level. So that really both sparked our putting out a call to colleagues that we had met um, through the Joy of Dementia uh, work and saying, hey, we got a response. Now, we had a particular response in mind that I can speak more about. But nevertheless, in some ways, we just said this is a moment we have to respond. It would be it would just be unconscionable not to. Um, And and I think so that's one pandemic related um, spark but also honestly it was a it um it was also a summer of a lot of unrest i mean george floyd and and so again regardless of how we felt about that it still was a moment where people were were rising up they were taking to the streets so in some sense that fervor was also very much in the in the air everywhere and then finally honestly it's because everyone discovered zoom 
I Zoom had been around for a long time. And I remember we, you know, during the first couple of years, you know, my brothers and sisters would, you know, have weekly Zoom calls, which I think a lot of people did. Now, we never talked to each other weekly ever. I mean, we love each other, but that was not part of our thing. And I remember at one point, my brother just saying, how come we've never done this before? So, you know, I mean, like it just introduced, there are just moments where you're introduced to something and it becomes on mass. Everybody was doing it. So really, I, there would not be a coalition if we weren't able to bring together people from, you know, the U.S. and, and South America and Africa. And, you know, it, it just wouldn't happen. And I think it's been powerful also because, and you and I have spoken a little bit about community before, I think people, I mean, this is a bit of a cliche, and I want to be careful because I think there's always different ways of approaching this, but people were eager for community. They wanted to be part of something um, for obvious reasons. And while I think our return to in-person life has shifted that a bit, I, I don't think it's any less you know, critical in our lives. Um, so that's really, as I said, that's what I've been doing is, is working with people. And this is a big part of the joy of dementia work is how do we, how do we create communities of support? Because as you know, and many of our listeners will know, and I don't think it's just unique to dementia. I don't think, I want to be careful because I don't think anything I'm saying, I think it, it could be applied to a lot of life situations, but we're talking about dementia. So but that, you know, where it, it just, it becomes almost immediately isolating. Like I've just spoken to so many people living with dementia, their families, their care partners, their friends. And they go from, you know, working, having a group of friends, whatever they're doing, whatever their interests were. One day they get the do- diagnosis and all of a sudden a lot of that disappears. Um, and that's a, that's a very difficult experience I, I think we underappreciate and I know I do and I just it, it's been really doing this work that I began to appreciate wow you're kind of that's a lot to go through I mean and particularly since it's not and I'm saying this I know people can come up with reasons why they disappear I'm not and I'm not I'm not, I'm not casting any blame people handle things the way they handle things but it's not even clear why or that we have to do it that way. And that's where I think the joy of dementia was born. I think we're, I think we're a bit over-determined by this kind of prevailing narrative about dementia. And I think it's got us so scared and afraid and disoriented that we just kind of lose sight of, well, there are other, there are ways to go about this. It doesn't have to be as devastating and as, <clears throat> stressful and 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 that will be there i mean my mom died of late stage dementia so i went through being with her and it it was i i freely say it was the most emotional um time of my life period and i've gone through a lot in my life i'm old enough that i can say that <laughs> um been, been around the block a few times <laughs> right and she lost her capacity to speak all those things and so we really had to keep reforming our relationship um, but at no point that I ever see it as a tragedy with either a small T or a large T, but particularly with a large T, which I think is what I mean when I say that the coalition and, and the joy of dementia in different ways, but, but I think share in a way of a, a deep, 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 deep commitment to overthrowing that big T tragedy narr- narrative. Um, which I think has been so harmful. Oh, I agree. Do you think that the reason people kind of disappear and and don't seek out or know to seek out a community um, of care, you know, help care helpers, I guess it might be a word, is because one, it's a terrifying diagnosis. It usually comes because of some emergency that you know, um, I have a past guest that referred to it as that Tuesday afternoon phone call that upends your life. Exactly. And then there's, there's no, you don't get support from the beginning. It's like, well, your person's oh. got Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or Lewy body or whatever. And you almost get a pat on the shoulder and a good luck. And there's the door. And the, you- Oh, I, I agree. And, and in many of the 
people that I, you know, friends now who live with dementia, who I've spoken to, you know, <laughs> you're told go home and get prepared to die. I mean, that's not a, that's not an overstay. I wish I could say, oh, well, no, that really doesn't happen that much, but it does. And it does today. I guarantee you the hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of people being diagnosed with dementia at this moment are hearing some variation of that message. And I agree with you because I think that, yes, it is. And this, again, coming back to this big P tragedy narrative that honestly, I think the biomedical system has helped perpetuate. Um, I don't, you know, it didn't appear out of nowhere. It wasn't, it's not like we got together one day and said, okay, how badly can we really treat people living with dementia? Let's scare folks to death and just condemn them to a, a non-existent life. So I like away. to think, I didn't walk away. I'd, I'd like to think better of the human species. But, and again, I'm not even interested in pointing fingers. If that blame isn't going to help anything, but I do certainly think there's contributors. So yeah, I mean, it's so surrounded by fear and shame and and um, stigma and just everything that we actually, as a human, as human beings, don't deal with well. I mean, shame is a fairly common. I actually think we live more and more in a shaming culture. We shame everyone. Yeah, but he's different than us. We shame them. So we don't like what somebody. We think we're better than someone. We shame them. I mean, it's just like breathing, sadly. And I'm not saying that lightly because I think it's a deeply corrosive phenomenon on the other hand it is so yeah it we don't handle shame well anyway uh, we don't handle we tend to then get angry or withdraw i mean i know what i do when i feel shame i'm you know i yeah let me at him um yeah <laughs> but yeah we're not very good at handling we're not very good at handling the emotionality of it um at all and i i say that with love um and I think, yeah, we we are, in a way, we're, and I hope this is what this phrase, I've never used it in an interview before, but we're kind of hoisted on our own petard. Because on one hand, we have, a, we live in a culture, and in, in many cases, we deeply value the, the, um, being these kind of rugged, self-reliant individuals. We do. I mean, that's our our mantra now leaving aside that actually it's largely a myth but that's that's perhaps a conversation for another day i could go into that but even if you think me but but even if you think wow individualism is the greatest thing since sliced bread it doesn't serve you well when you're in need of a community and support now and that doesn't have to be dementia um at all i know people in fact we um one of the, when Dr. Massad, my partner, was dying, and she passed away about a year and a half ago, and she was dying of multiple cancers, um, you know, we, she had a team of support around her, and in part, and actually over her 30-year practice as a physician, and an enormously innovative and caring physician, she had created a model she called health teams. And they were really designed initially primarily for health situations where the patient or the person diagnosed could call together a group. It could be friends, family, stranger, whoever they wanted around them, including medical professionals, care professionals. And it really was designed to not only be of support, which is important, but it also, the design of them is to try to kind of shift the balance between every decision and every feeling being just that of the individual's so in a way, how could we, how can you kind of even modestly transform, oh, it's my health, to, oh, no, it's ours. This is a shared experience. No one living with somebody with cancer, for example, doesn't have that experience. I mean, you don't, you aren't suddenly walled off from having the feelings. Are you having the same experience? No, but that's true in life. Because um, you're not having the same experience doesn't mean you're not having an emotional part and that you're not part of this social, what's happening socially. So really, that's been very helpful because in our um, 
Oh, I know. But but the story I was tell to your point was so we she was interviewed by a reporter from the um a, a, a very well known health newsletter. And we kind of got to know her and her us. And afterwards I was talking to her and she said, you know, my best friend, her best, best, best friend forever, was um diagnosed with cancer and she shut everybody out. And again, I think just let them sink in for a moment. Because we've both probably done this and been on the receiving end. That that's an awful feeling. And it's also a there's and given the current setup, we can't even do much about it. Like it, you feel powerless, even as you also feel like, well, wait a minute, this is a woman person I love, I care for, I, she's been a part of my life, and all of a sudden, but it happens. So again, it's we aren't very good at asking for help, um, and we're certainly not given the tools and resources and support to create those communities of support. Because, and in a way, we're offering this as an alternative to. Not instead of, but as an alternative to, yes, if you can find support, great. Go to every place imaginable. However, as you well know, in many communities and, and across the country, there's just not enough support, um, no matter what. And, and that's tragic, and we should change that. And if I had a magic wand, I would. However, given the current realities, we're saying, okay, but we, we, we don't have to be just passive bystanders in our own lives, any aspect of our lives. We can also create them, and we can be empowered to create the support, even as we continue to try to find it. But we don't, it, it doesn't have to be an either or. Oh, well, I couldn't find anything. Whoop, I guess that's. That's it for me. And that often happens. I'm not saying that lightly. I think it leaves people in an awful position. So to the extent that we can, in our workshops, and our conversations, say, okay, well, let's at least, we can give you some tools and support to do something a little different, to be able to bring people together. And in our case, we draw heavily on, and this is, it's, it's an approach that both Susan and I have been familiar with for 40 some years. So this isn't new and it wasn't new. And we obviously have now brought it into the dementia field, but it's really an approach that's been informed by the, what we found to be just the incredible power of play, of performance, and, and particularly of improvisation. It's obviously a kind of play. I am, you know, I mean, I respect all the other things that are being done in the dementia world, um, but I absolutely believe that we, if we were able to lead more improvisational and playful lives as a whole, not when the moment where you're hit with possibly one of the most uh, upsetting and frightening moments in your life, <laughs> then I think our relationship a lot of, to a lot of this would shift. Does it make everything okay? Of course not. But it certainly would, again, empower us to be able to do different kinds of things, to create support, to be, to be able to do something more powerful, more joyful, just more positive, more giving. It does, we're not victims. Like, that makes sense. You know, so that's really what, I mean, there's a lot of things, nuances in that, but that's really what we, we're very committed to doing. So my mom thought I was her best friend, which, you know, that could be worse. But we had a very formalish kind of relationship, uh -huh. and it made it very hard to, you know, when you think of behaving properly, you know, you're going to uh -huh. be different with your family or your partner yeah. versus the neighbors, just because that's how we are. And right. so that's, we had a very, you know, I hesitate to use the word uptight, but it was almost an uptight relationship. Yeah, sure. My Both sure. my parents were a little bit uptight my entire growing up. So that, that didn't help at all with her Alzheimer's. So with somebody like me, where would you suggest I start to, you know, bring a little more joy into the caring that I had to do for my mom? Well, let me just have to take a couple of questions and, and then I can, okay. I can again, I'll, I'll try to respond as, because I'd like to be able to respond to you as much rather than just these vague generalizations. Although, you know, I can do that too. I can be as vague <laughs> and as general as everybody. Um, so when you say it was a, so how, so you had a kind of, 
how did you describe it? Kind of distant, more formal. Yeah, more. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just more. It was friendly yeah, and right. positive, but, you know, people, my mom had a tendency to constantly wring her hands or rub her hands on her leg or, sure. I mean, her hands were always in motion. And after a while, it was like, you just wanted to reach over and just grab her hands and stop it because it just... Yeah. I don't have any anxiety or any of those things other than you know, like the normal crap we all deal with. <laughs> right. Um, I don't have any diagnoses is what I'm trying to say, but it just, it wound me up to the point where it's was like, Ugh. like you just, yeah. mm, sure. you're gritting your teeth. And it's like, that's obviously not a positive feeling. And then, so somebody had suggested once, you know, to put, you know, give her a, her a little hand massage, put some, you know, hand cream on her. So I put hand cream in my hands, rubbed it in my hands. I swear they're always as dry as paper. And then I rubbed him in, you know, I'm like, oh, because I think she was saying something about her hands being itchier. Yeah. There was sure. a, there was a catalyst for, oh, I can, yeah. I can, I can manage this without sure. it being weird. And I put the hand cream, you know, on my hands and rubbed it into her hands. What a disaster. Because then she just like wrung her hands. Oh, my hands are all right. sticky. And I, and it was just, exactly. I, I think <laughs> if I were very concerned about my hands, I could see where that would not be the most. And I get, I'm not saying this critically, but I can understand that. Well, I it's guess just, so. But let's let's turn it back on you because I think that, for example, and, I, and tell me if I'm, be, I mean, I'm really not trying to be um, unduly philosophical, but I am going to be philosophical because that's an integral part of what I've been trained to do. Um, so one of the things that stands out for me is. The suggestions were about her and how to help her not do the thing that was driving you crazy. And I, again, that's just, and I think that's very common. Uh, almost immediately, and I think this is true of regular old carers, professional care, we're, we're just, our understanding of caring almost is okay, you gotta then, you gotta deal with the person. You got, to take care of their needs You've, and hopefully you do it as kindly as possible but let's that's fine and I believe you would I don't and most of us I think at least would like to be kind however I guess now let's pull the lens back because in the approach that we use which again has been informed by many many years of practice our focus isn't on the individual not even the individual patient. We don't believe that it, it everything. We don't even believe the disease simply rests inside the individual. That the, I mean, dementia, cancer. It, it, they're profoundly and socially shaped. I mean, our understanding of it. And I'm not saying I don't know what dementia does to the brain. I'm fascinated by people who've studied it. It's all very interesting. But we're not reducible to our brain. It has a much more, it has an emotional impact, it has a social impact, it has a physical impact. I mean, it's all very complex. But I guess in pulling back the lens, where I would focus is the relationship. Okay. And how could we support you to, to find some new ways to, to build the relationship rather than, as opposed to perhaps, Managing your mother, and I'm saying that somewhat, you know. And so, for example, I was thinking, and again, tell me if you just think this is too freaking weird and that's fine. But <laughs> okay. this has really happened, and this, I've done this with people, so it's not like I'm making it up. But so, for example, you said you her rubbing her hands drives you crazy. Well, there's an infinitude of fun and creative ways that you could give expression to that. I don't okay. think the issue is being driven crazy by things. Believe me, my mom could push my buttons unlike anyone I'd ever met. I mean, she just knew how to do it. So yeah, like from the moment you walk in the door, it's like, ooh, boop, let me push that button. Yep, exactly. That's how my mom was. <laughs> exactly. And in a way, and, and again, that's why family dynamics are very difficult in this because you've just got years of history, frustration, resentments, irritations. So, but And none of that is going away. We're not trying to. We're not saying to you, Jennifer, oh, treat your mother nicer. You're going to be irritated. What can you do? It's irritating. Or you find it irritating. But how, what else can you do? What can you do with the irritation 
that would kind of take it out of the realm of whether it's true or not. So, for example, I was thinking about a, a woman. She, uh, it was a, one of the workshops that we did, Joy of Dementia workshops. And she and her mother did not have a close relationship. And she was, but she came to it and she was very honest. And, and she was saying her mother was dying, you know, was or was declining. Um, and that she just didn't know how to be with her. Cause they, and so we, but she said, but she would like to. She would like to find a way to be closer to her. So we just were playing around with some things. And what she ended up doing was she had to sell her mother's jewelry, which was very important to her mother. And she was very worried about it because she didn't want it. She thought it would upset her. So we just came up with some ways, gave her some directions. And what she did was she wore the jewelry and she never wore jewelry. This was not someone who wore jewelry. Visited her mom, showed it off, and asked her mom for help in deciding how much to ask. And that, so immediately it shifted the relationship and including that it, it invited her mom into shaping what they were going to do together like it wasn't just oh what am i like there, there's this is a relationship so and you know so i and i've often said to people okay if you're upset or angry then do an angry dance oh, really do a frustration dance like what are we do we really think as as a dear friend and mentor who taught me a lot about the how to be a therapist said you know, we really do live in a culture where we believe that there's only roughly four ways to express emotionality when there's an infinitude of ways. Like, and I often, when I was a therapist, like people would come in and this is the wondrousness of, of, of improvisation, which I can say a little bit about. But when I was a therapist, you know, couples in particular, <laughs> which were never my favorite, but somebody would come in and say oh and they, they were having the 55th same fight over the yeah. same thing really and, and i'm sure you never have done that but or <laughs> anyone in our listening audience has ever had the same stupid fight with their partner their children their boss whatever so i just said well look i don't i mean again i i never try to stop people from doing things that they're gonna i'm not trying to you know uh, marshal her life but i said well at a minimum, you know, what you can do if you walk in and, I don't know, your partner says, blah, 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 I didn't do the dishes, and you and you know it's going to trigger the exact same, then at a minimum say, wait, cut. This wasn't a very good play we're creating here. Um I, what are, at least ask a question how do we want to do this it makes now, sense could, you could decide that nah, we're going to have the same old stupid fight but your relationship to it has dramatically changed because rather than being this kind of victimized oh there's nothing else i can do when i'm angry you become a choice creator and a choice maker and to me, that already puts you in a more humanizing position because so much of the reactiveness is just that we feel either, and I don't, I don't mean that we're, we, we're very passive about life. Like, and I really, and again, I always used to say to patients, hey, you know, this isn't a dress rehearsal for the real mm -hmm. thing. But that's really what people came in to talk about. It's like, okay, when am I going to get, how do I get ready for the real thing? This isn't a dress <laughs> rehearsal. This interview is not a dress rehearsal for the real thing. We're creating it as we go along, and, and it'll be what it will be. Hopefully, it's mm -hmm. helpful to some folks. But it could be. But and honestly, and I'm not saying this. But, but if we, if it was horrible, we could recreate it. It's true. Not like we don't have that capacity. And I think, and I was thinking about this off of with something you said before. And I think it's also tapping into and helping people realize that we can perform, that we just aren't who we are and our identities and the ways that we insist we have to be, which we do, and we're supported to do. I'm not, again, I'm not casting aspersions on anyone. And before you said something like, well, you're different with your family than you are with your friends, that you are if you go to church or temple or whatever. And, and although this isn't, isn't a way that we, describe ourselves but we're always creating new performances 
Like I dress differently for this Zoom session than I did for one with, you know, a friend. I it's a, And there's also a way we know how to be. We know how to perform. We know the costume. We know the lines. We know how to be <laughs> at church. And being at church is not how you're going to be at a bar. That's true. <laughs> now, is it sometimes scripted? Yes. On the other hand, it, it at least opens the door to, okay, how do I want to perform this? How do I want to perform as my mother's daughter in this case? So maybe, and then... And and in this case, it is a bit more improvisational. There's no scripts. Believe me, if there were, <laughs> I would have grabbed them. Me too. But but you're also not powerless in that, including, but where I think what's critical, and this is where the communities of support come in, you can't do it alone. We don't perform alone. We don't play alone. None of this am I suggesting, oh, just go off and, and you know, do a bit of an attitude shift. No, I think you would then need to create a community of support that can support you to go outside your comfort zone and try some things with your mom. Your mom isn't going to be, I mean, she will be part of the ensemble and that's important. And I think she could probably do more than probably. And I think people living with dementia can do a heck of a lot more than we get them credit for because they're really invited in, in any kind of serious, meaningful, belonging way. But for the moment, I'm talking to you or our listeners. We need, like I took very Seriously, that if I wanted to continue to be giving to my mom, and I, w- I did, even though she could drive me mad, I love her <laughs> to death, um, I had to get the support I needed to deal with the emotional. I mean, it was just extremely emotional to deal with the stress, to kind of find ways to keep, which didn't mean not being honest with her. I mean, I remember one time she just, um, I think it was around the time that it was clear she was going to stay in a nursing home for the, for, and it, as it turned out, it wasn't that long a time, but that was, she wasn't going home again. And she just was deeply upset and it just broke my heart. And I'm, and I, she was crying and I, and this sounds like a small thing, but I remember really wrestling with, I want to cry. I, there's nothing else to do. It, it is, it's just, it's not, and, but I was thinking, God, should I show her that, you know, should I remain strong? Da, 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 da. And I remember just thinking, no, this is what I can give her right now. So I just started crying with her. And, you know, we went on and that was that. But, but it wasn't, so not everything. I think, again, one of the things that I would love to give people is I think we can also work to break free of how we've been taught what it means to care and to take care of people. Because I think one, um, in fact, I was just reading an article by someone who was a lovely piece about her, what she learned about her dad having to mention what she went through. But at some point she said, well, you know, if I had known more, I would have taken care of myself more. I hear that a lot. Exactly. But I think what I would add to that, I agree with her, but what I would add to that is I think we make too much of a dichotomy. I don't think it's, well, I'll either take care of my dad or my mom. And again, fill in dementia or any other kinds of things that we end up taking care of. Or I'll take care of myself because it just, one, I think it's a false dichotomy. But two, I think taking care of myself was an important part of taking care of the relationship. And taking mm-hmm. care, wanting, and making sure that I was in the best possible position to give. Um, and it, it wasn't; it had nothing to do with sacrifice. It had nothing to do with you know the kind of language that can get called up. It was just, um, hey, I want to take care of the relationship because that was so important to me. Um, so, so yes. Uh, how do I, I mean, it would be like anything, like you hear actors, and I find theater analogies very helpful. <laughs> like actors, very experienced actors go on stage, and or TV or whatever, it doesn't have to be theater, but, um, and I'm always amazed at how much preparation they put into their roles. Like they really learn about the person, they learn, and if it's, you know, they learn how to move or whatever is called upon in some cases, they might have to learn how to speak. I wish we would put the same kind of preparation into 
how in these kinds of life challenges. And I don't mean that as some kind of burden. It's just for me, that meant I had to prepare and involve a whole ensemble of people to be a part of that because I couldn't do it alone. And I needed to take seriously, okay, what do I need to be emotion- as emotionally healthy as I can be? And in some cases, that meant going further than I'd ever gone emotionally. So it is going to, it can be difficult. It can be challenging. It can be embarrassing. It can be whatever. So I think that it's not a, it's not a panacea. Um, <laughs> I was shed this was my mom to a T. She, you know, she wasn't the most patient of people and she just <laughs> didn't tolerate nonsense. I mean, she, so I was there. It was, I'd been told, I'd phoned down because I'd been, she was in Texas. I was in New York. She, I'd been told she had a week to live. And so I went down and I was by her bedside. And again, she had long ago, she was, I, I, I don't even know how to describe it because I don't think it, she was in her own world because I don't particularly like that phrase, but she clearly wasn't relating to me. Okay. She's relating to something or someone and she seemed she was very content and and again she would occasionally babble, but she couldn't she couldn't speak. I mean she had lost her capacity to speak, whatever. But so I was like, I was crying and I was even I was feeling like I was being a little dramatic. Uh, and and she wasn't hadn't been looking at me, and all of a sudden she kind of lifted her head, looked me square in the eye, and said in the way that she could say it, "What do you want?" <laughs> and then she was she she went back. That's and what was funny. funny is I of course got upset. Like well, you're dying. What do you mean? What do you mean? Yeah. I thought oh <laughs> give it up, Mary. Like <laughs> it was kind of. I mean, I'm glad we had that moment of connection. Um, so it's not, again, this, these are all, but but the reason I value improvisation um, and being more improvisational is because it just gives us more flexibility and fluidity with how to deal with all that life throws at us. Because dementia, I mean, the, a lot of the, the problems I have with kind of the official literature and even it's it's not because i don't think these are very smart good people it's not that it's just that as much as we say and as much as people living with dementia say if you've met one person living with dementia you've met one person living with dementia yep. well if we're going to take that seriously then we need to kind of explore approaches and that are actually designed to allow you to do that because we don't do that well in our culture we True. tend to see people in sweeping generalizations oh you're <laughs> this oh and it doesn't even have to be bad it's not even like oh you're a republican or you're a democrat or whatever it's more like oh she's a goody two-shoes or oh she's a blonde or oh <laughs> she's short or we i mean we assume we know people within two and a half seconds of seeing them, getting to know that. And then we kind of go from there. And I'm not, again, this is, I know I'm making some, but, and I don't even think it's that extreme a generalization. So really, yes, I firmly believe that we need to find a way to respond to the actuality of what's going on, the real person, the real relationship, and keep finding ways to play with that. To just not be as driven by our assumptions and our, our, um, like our biases, our biases, whatever that we bring into it. And again, nothing's going to be perfect. It just gives you a shot. But even my finding, and when I talk about the joy of dementia, that's the joy for me, because even if we can do something, and I'm glad that now this is visual because people can't see me doing my, uh, fingers this much, but it doesn't have to be big. Like That's when, her, true. when this woman wore the jewelry and had that moment, does that mean that two minutes later, her mom might've just been in a very different place and they had to do something probably. And it was a moment of joy for both of them. It was a new kind of connection. And I think what she shared with us is she was thrilled because she she was able to experience something she didn't believe was possible. And I, I think, understand that. I think we all walk around with such a limited sense of our own possibilities 
And I think we, we, and that's why I think bringing in the communities of support um, is critical because you can't, you can't step outside of your comfort zone that easily to take risks or to try new things or to be silly or to be more playful, whatever that is. No, I mean, again, theater and actors have entire ensembles and they do that for a reason. I don't care who, if there's a star performer, the ensemble makes the play because if the rest of the ensemble is crap, I don't care what that (laughs) guy does or woman does. It's not going to happen. It's a collaborative creation. And I think that's, um, I just think we, we, I want to support people having more of that. Um, and that, will that look different for you than it did for me? Of course. I don't, you have particular needs. You have a particular community. You have a particular emotionality. You blah, blah, blah. But, and again, I would personally, I advocate for doing this way sooner in life and not wait for the tragedies. I mean, because again, like anything, the moment of try it's not, it's not that it there it can't open up opportunity because again we were talking early the pandemic the pandemic in many ways was horrific i mean and i think we're still feeling it in so many mm-hmm. ways on the other hand it provided opportunity it did yep and i think we fortunately some of us were able to step through them and so nothing is ever black and white um but there's so many life situations that are related to so privately like i I've done health teams, that model, with people looking for jobs, for example. Because looking for a job is rough. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that we do very privately. And something that can be very stressful, very shaming, all that, the emotionality of it is. Fortunately, I haven't looked for a job in a long time. But I do remember that that the emotionality of it is horrific. Um, So... You know, it's any place where we, if we could just deprivatize it a little bit um, and kind of open it up to how a kind of, in a way, a collective eye rather than just, and, and you're always a part of it. It's not like you disappear, but it's also saying, okay, I realize I don't want to kind of, I can't, or it's not very healthy for me to try to do this in that kind of super narrowly focused individualistic kind of way that deprives you of so much support and, and joy. And that could be one person, it could be two people, it could be a hundred people, depending on. Um, and I think it, it works in part because you're inviting people to do this kind of thing with you. And honestly, if they don't want to or can't, and that's fine. It's not... Um, but I think people find it. So I'm currently in as part of a health team for a woman who lives with dementia. And, and it's just been, but the design of it is everyone is supported to grow because, and to be able, because I don't know, like, for example, in this, um, I don't quite, I mean, you know, it's been, there are many conversations, but she was talking about, and actually, interestingly, we created it. Because she was now taking care of her daughter, who had very serious health issues. So it wasn't because she had dementia, although because she's living with dementia, it was it, it adds to the challenge. Yeah. But we brought it together. She brought together her. We brought together people that we knew. And, um, and I think at one point, and it, again, alludes back a little bit to what we were saying, but at one point she was talking about how she just couldn't do anything else in her life basically she was kind of doing what we often do which i i I have to focus on this she needs me if i'm not here something's going to happen understandable and the group or the other people in the group were kind of going along with it it wasn't like um and then but which led to a really helpful conversation about okay how do we want to support her to care for her daughter because I personally, I don't believe that caring for someone means not continuing to grow and develop in your own life. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't inform it. I mean, obviously. Uh, and this was somewhat after the most immediate tragedy had started. So, it's, again, you, you realize that it was a slightly different circumstance. But it's also just 
it's it's just a friendly, supportive way to kind of go, oh, why do I think I have to do it this way? Like, if only asking that question, what? Huh. And then you might go, oh, nope, that makes me too uncomfortable. I'm going to go back to how I'm. But again, at least you're letting in for a moment that, oh, huh, I don't, I don't know that I have to do it this way. There's no law. Nothing was written. Just falling from the sky. Thing. <laughs> Every time not you get angry. In, not carved yeah. in stone. Exactly. So that's the playfulness of it. It's not just having a riot really good time. And I know when you and I spoke initially, and this is coming up again, like and I shared, you know, when the, when the Washington Post covered the joy of dementia work, um, you know, we got a lot of very angry responses. I mean, there are a lot of people who do simply are offended that you're even using joy in the same sentence as dementia or play or laughter or fun. And I found it very interesting. I found the actually angry ones terribly enlightening, including one woman who said, yeah, we're just going to laugh because grandma, you know, could burn the house down or she's not going to, yeah, we're going to go fall because she's not going to see her granddaughter walk down the aisle. You know, all of that. And I understood the rage and the impotence. I do. Um, I felt it. And it was helpful because that's not what we're talking about. I think laughter is important. I love laughter. And actually, a lot of people living with dementia have told me, look, we just want to have fun. <laughs> like they're not, they are not as caught up in this stuff as the rest of us are. Um, and I don't think simplistic. Their lives are very complex. It's not to say they don't have other emotions, but I take that seriously. We're going to listen to them. But but the playing, it's, it's the, the joy is in just realizing you don't have to get stuck. And we have the capacity to unstick ourselves, collaboration with others. We don't have to get into these ruts that make us so unhappy, make us so reactive. Um, it could be in big ways, it could be in little ways. But to even have that glimmer of the wearing of the jewelry and seeing and her, that to me was joyous. And again, it's, and we can all do it with support and having the support to decide, okay, yeah, I want to make that move in my life because it would open up my life a lot more. Because again, I wish caring for a, a very sick or elderly person was the only time that we're, you know, we feel infinite. We can't, I mean, when I was a therapist, and I, and I think it's still true given the mental health crisis that's going on in our country, I mean, and, you know, very well-known play advocate, Brian Singer, Brian, Brian Singer-Smith. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, I, I love what he wrote. He said, the opposite of play is not the existing reality or work. It's depression. And I, good- really, I really believe that. I think we are depressed um, in a way globally but certainly in our own lives. And and to me, hey, given what's going on in the world, I think we could heed his remarks and take them a little more seriously and find ways to incorporate play and performing and improvisation in our lives. However, that whatever that looks like for us, we're not mandating it. Because I just think um, so many people come into therapy and what they say, basically, whatever their presenting issue is, it's, I'm stuck and I can't get unstuck. And that I makes think sense. Real. That is so painful. I am having the same fight with my partner. I am having the same. I don't know what to do about my teenager who, you know, whatever, suddenly become a, a little monster, whatever it is. <laughs> I don't know how to deal with my toxic ball, blah, blah, blah. But really, I think what they're saying is I'm stuck and I can't get unstuck. Um, and I think we're stuck. And I don't think the existing um, ways that we've historically become unstuck work very well anymore. And I think people are understandably very wary of a lot of traditional institutions. Yeah. We can decide how we choose to express an unhappiness. I'm not, I'm not getting into that for the moment. Hopefully we'll do it in, you know, in ways that are, are caring of our fellow human beings. But that's not even the point right now. I think it's more... How do we, it's going to have to be a collective effort. It's going to have to be something we do together with somebody because we're, right now we are, I think people walk around in feeling enormously powerless. Um, 
in the sense of not we we just don't have much of a say both in what currently happens in the world, but also we don't feel like we have what we need to create alternatives that would work for us. And that's what for me the joy of dementia and the the coalition were efforts to do, which was to create kind of um, independent, if you will, um, communities, which in, again, various ways of support um, for people around the world. And I think it's been particularly helpful for folks, for example, who like we work with a lot of teachers and, and being an educator these days is, is maddening. Mm. I mean, yeah. it's, it's impossible, or nurses, or doctors, whatever you can. And, um, but we work and train a lot of, of people around the world um, who work in these various areas. And really, they want to be more, clear. they want to be more, they want to try some new things. They don't think that how the training they've received is enough. But they can't do it within their own institution. They just can't. It's Those aren't, in a way, they're not institutions are not designed to be laboratories for innovation or creativity. If they were, we wouldn't have a problem. So we, sense. we very selfish, we very self-consciously created where we're independent of, of, of traditional funding, government funding. We, we were independent of academia, although many of our founders were extraordinarily talented academics, but we said from the get go, we have to create a way for us to be as, radically humanistic, as provocative, or whatever we need to do to make an impact and to help people, we've got to have the freedom to do that. We're not going to, you can't do something, because, as you know, with particularly relative to funding so often, you know, you try these things, they're wonderful, and then the funding disappears. And yeah. we're screwed. I mean, they really are, and people are hurt. I was talking to an academic the other day who actually said she's never again going to do a project that after the research is done, it disappears. Like she just thinks it's unethical. And I do too. Because real people are being helped. Like it's not, it's not an abstract, you know, it's not just, oh, isn't it too bad that program disappeared? Real people were being helped by it. It was extraordinarily successful. So now what are they supposed to do? So I think that we, and in our modest ways, and we're very modest, you know, um, we want, we're also here to support anyone who wants to go a little further, try some things that are new or different um, at whatever level. So I welcome anyone and everyone who's listening if they want to be in touch with me or if they'd like, or if I can just support them in any way. Um, I would love to. Um, but, and please, you know, take advantage of us. That makes sense. So let me ask you one quick last question. Sure. Is um, one of the things that I did for a while with my mom, and people thought I was insane, is I would take mom out for a walk in the park, yeah. ice cream, nails, whatever. And I frequently took one of her friends with us. So I took out two old ladies yeah. with Alzheimer's. That's people wonderful. are like, you took what? both of them and you brought them both back? I'm like, so oh, why yeah. did they, I, I'm genuinely curious. Why did they think that was weird? Because they knew how hard it was with, you know, uh -huh. just dealing with my mom. And so, like, why would you double it? And I'm like, it's not doubling it. They deal with each other. They talk to oh. each other. And right. I can enjoy, for the most part, it, it didn't always last as long as their conversations lasted. But I could enjoy their whatever. Like, we went out to a regional park and there was this, like, trampled path from a picnic table down this very steep slope next uh -huh. to this tree. These two old ladies talked about that damn slope for like 25 minutes. That's great. Like, oh my. I'm like, well, at least you're not talking to me about it for 25 minutes. Cause I, I love I, it. I mean, amongst other things, I, I mean, it would be silly for me to say, oh no, that was crazy. Cause that's exactly what I'm suggesting. to. Well, so my question is, <laughs> yeah. Well, so my question is if you're feeling like my biggest challenge with my mom is she was always afraid to try do things with me. Cause she didn't want to make a mistake. She didn't want to screw yep, up. Sure. And I could not get her past that feeling. Maybe some l different training I might've been able to, but I was, and I was really stupid and reluctant to listen to the suggestions of my guests until okay. it was da down to the wire <laughs> with mom. Um, because you know, there were quote logical reasons why I couldn't do it that way. Ugh, that makes uh. me crazy thinking about it. 
Yeah. But if sure. in feeling stuck and frustrated and just like, oh my God, I'm not doing a good enough job. If we just ask ourselves the question, like, what crazy ASS thing should I try just to prove this wouldn't work? Like, can you rephrase that question so it makes a little bit more well, sense? I, yeah, like, I think. Um, like, how can you jumpstart your mental thought process to, okay. well, to, maybe- to radically try something different? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Okay, maybe this will be of help or not. And I'm happy to talk offline as well. I know we are running out of time. But let me just touch very quickly on the tenets of improv, which I think are critical here. The te- basic tenet of improv is yes and, which people, some people have probably heard. What yes and means is that, one, it's, a, it's an ensemble building. So it's not about the individuals. And it's a, so if you said to me, I'm afraid to go out. I don't whatever it was. It's my that's an to use the language of improv. That's an offer. So it's up to me as part of this ensemble to take what you're saying, not negate it, not to say that's stupid. Why are you afraid? Which because sadly we live in a culture that's much more oriented toward yes, but or no. We're we're we're. It, we find it harder to do yes and because it's a radical acceptance. It's not a critique. It has nothing to do with how it makes us feel. It's not it has nothing to do with our opinion. I mean, there are many things I might do, but at a minimum, I would be curious. Oh, tell me more about like I I I would love to hear more about. It's like, what are you afraid of? Why are you like? It, it, it's just an opportunity to get to know someone better. You don't have to. Get them to, it's just more that it takes that. Now, there are some things, there are some offers that might lend themselves to, all right, um, let's let's create a little um, anxiety dance together, or let's try to poem about it. I mean, I, you know, when I, I've written, I wrote many, in fact, I was just talking to a friend of mine who sadly is dying and uh, of cancer, and but one of the things he said was it's it's also been a, a real opening for writing poetry. And I I think that poetry is wonderful. Like you could write poems about your feelings. You could write poems about anxiety together. Because it begins to relate to it as, oh, not as the truth, not as as you said before, set in stone. I don't know what it means if you say to me, I'm scared to go outside. Why would I respond? How would I know? So you could begin to unpack that and see, and then maybe that opens up other opportunities. But I think attitudinally, it's positioning yourself as the acceptor of offers and the builder of that rather than saying no <laughs> or staying so confined. And and I appreciate that you said you you. Because, yes, we can look back on things and go, why was I so freaking narrow-minded? Like, yeah. oh, come on. Like, what rested on my making that point? So I think that's why improv in the yes and mentality is a way. It's just helpful because at least it jogs us a little bit out of our own 
getting caught up in our own scripts. And I think there's glorious things. You could paint it. You could, you know, you could discover something about it. It's just whatever breaks it out of that same old routine and the same. Um, and I'm not saying this again. I just make sure it's not a panacea. A lot of life is tough. Dimension can be tough. So we're always going to have to be making these decisions. It's not like it ever. But I do, I really do think it, it has, it's what it brings to our lives. And the ways it can, in little ways, or it can help us just become a little less stuck. Um, to me, that's a win. I would agree. And I've learned since my mom's passed away, which is not helpful for me, things that I would have liked to have tried. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we went, when I didn't bring mom with another, so my mom was a Diane and her other two friends were Diane's, as if mm -hmm. that was any, you know, just to complicate <laughs> life as it was. So there's mom, other Diane, and other, other Diane. Uh -oh. And I, we ended up going to the park or the pool or wherever to watch kids. And getting from the car yeah. to a spot yeah. to watch children was stressful and difficult. But yeah. once we were there, she relaxed. And, you know, I could answer emails on my phone or just enjoy the sunshine and uh -huh. the, the warm air, at whatever. And it just, it it worked. But yeah. now I'm thinking, you know, what if there was a way of maybe meeting a friend that had a grandkid yeah. We could have met I mean, in the park and played or done something that would have even been better. It's like, dang, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, to put simply, we can't think about that. We're individually, we're terribly limited. That's why I think at least having opening this up and because I don't even and, and I love that you're discovering it now. And I think it's going to be helpful to other people because it's very ordinary ways we do this. And it's helpful to know what you have available to you, like to, to, to view that. And I know this, people think, oh, well, you're just saying this because, I don't know, I'm a theater person, but I am. So. <laughs> but I think that's why ensembles are so wonderful. To viewing life as an ensemble. Who's in your ensemble? Because even if you decide never to utilize them, I think it would come easier to go, oh, yeah, so-and-so has a grandchild. Let's pull them into the play. They can create this. And what it would mean if they paint, or what it would mean if Joe Schmo, who, you know, like, what kind of play do I we create together um it just opens it up a bit it just offers it just opens up more possibilities again it's up to you to decide and choose hopefully with the support of others but however you do it to make the decision ultimately what you want to do and yes for me sometimes we have to live with maybe it was just not the best decision in the whole world <laughs> but again the wonderful thing about performance and improv is you just recreate it you just say take two it, there are do-overs in life. Contrary to what we kind of, how we live our lives, we really can do things over. That's true. Yeah. Hopefully we won't have to do this over, but <laughs> <laughs> everything else I, we can do over. I, I think this has been good. Um, well, thank you. Uh, whenever I get ideas like, oh, I could have tried this with mom or that, I know that probably other people are feeling the same way. Hopefully they're not looking backwards and saying, I wish I could have done this, but yeah. I'm hoping they're hearing this and going, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Or, like, I'm struggling to think of any of my friends that had grandchildren that would have been about the right age. Yeah. But, you know, and my well, biggest struggle was my friends, some of them had already gone through this dementia caregiving oh, yeah. and they were not particularly interested in joining up again. Sure. Some of them were also going through it, but in different, you know, locations. So... We needed to bring together a team, but then get creative. And I and I say this with love. I'm really not trying to be. <laughs> don't worry. You'll have other opportunities. True. Like, in a way, as a life skill, I can't imagine it's not going to be situated. Where, again, I think it's helpful in just unpacking any, like, stress-filled or, or not even not stress-filled life. I mean, sadly, we're not lacking them at this point. I mean, I really feel for, and I understand completely what you're saying about how you wish you could have done some things with your mom. Um, and, you know, and hopefully it sounds like you're learning from them and that's valuable and you can share that and we're sharing that with others. So some, somebody's mom is going to benefit from this. That's so, the whole point of doing these. That's the whole point of doing them. Indeed. 
Well, thank you so much for having me. This was you're just, welcome. This was fun and um, and if anybody wants to get a hold of you, should I put your email in the show notes yeah. or okay? Please, I, please, so that please. you guys heard all that, I'll make sure Mary's email is in the show notes if you want to contact yeah, her about the program. That would be great. Wonderful. Well, thank you, and have thank a good you. rest of your uh, day. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.